Uh, this is an initiative of Spain and more specifically of the Spanish Radio Academy. They have during many years insisted with the proclamation of a, of a day that would honor uh, radios or that would um, in a way highlight the services that radio has uh, provided humanity along its history. Because if you think of the world wars, if you think of many other historical uh, situations in our um, humanity, you know, you always have radio there somewhere uh, playing a role. So um, they rallied, they rallied behind them all the regional broadcasting organizations, the African Broadcasting Union, the European one, the Caribbean one, the Asian Pacific, so all the regional broadcasting unions and other broadcasters, and they um, they proposed this proclamation first to UNESCO. So UNESCO proclaimed it as an international uh, as an international day. But then the General Assembly of the United Nations in New York, um, upon presentation of UNESCO of this day, they proclaimed it in turn as an international day of the UN to be observed by all UN and uh, its partners. So thereby it became one of the UN International Days. So it's not just UNESCO celebrating, it's also all the other UN agencies. And it was, the date was chosen in the, uh, in the recognition of UN radio, uh, which was created on the 13th of February, because otherwise, you, in the history of radio itself, you have many countries involved, many scientific people, many, many uh, technological discoveries. It's not one person that created radio station. You have people in India, you have people in uh, Italy, you have, you know, uh, if you want more about the first uh, half century that has passed, then go to unesco.org and you have a page of the history of radio the first 50 years. We should do the other 50 years, but <laughs> so the first 50 years we have them. So this about the history of, uh, of radio station, of, of the, sorry, the history of the proclamation of radio. The idea is to uh, highlight this uh, and the importance of this. If there is a manufacturer of cars, which is thinking of not including AM, FM and shortwave broadcast like they are considering some of them now, this for us citizens, it's a problem because then we would only rely on the radio that goes on the internet, which is not necessarily impartial, which in turn can derive in problems with uh, connecting with uh, peace, um, uh, it's not necessarily the radio station that we tackle public interest. So we need to remind the world also that the digital divide exists. Mm. So most of the people are not connected and they still listen to radio on the transistor. <laughs> or maybe they share one computer at home if they are lucky and um, let's say uh, in a good uh, economic condition, they have one computer at home and, and they have a certain connectivity that allows them to listen to radio stations. The statistics can be found in the ITU website of how many host households really are connected to internet and if they are connected, how many devices they possess to really connect um, to internet. So. We have this. We have also the second situation of in case of emergency, war, floodings, etc. What is still working and functioning and can give information to people that will save their lives? It's still radio, you know. Uh, if you have a flooding, you don't have any more internet. You don't have connect. You know. You know. You don't have. Um, electricity sometimes and uh, 
even if you have the battery on your phone, at one point it will die if you don't connect it, you know. So there are so many situations in which you need even wind up radio, wind up a transistor you know, the, or the ones that charge with solar energy. And this is the situation in most of the world. It's not true that all people have access to Internet. Not yet. We hope we will be there, you know, but not yet. So it is in a way to remind um, to remind uh, decision makers, duty bearers, but also the citizens that if they want impartial information, fact based, checked information, balanced, that will give the microphone to both sides, they'd rather use uh, radio. And uh, lastly, I wanted to say something else, uh, but now it escaped my mind. <laughs> no, I, wanted to, um, I wanted to add on what you just said now because you just reminded me um, about the fact that the other means of communication, um, TV, um, you know, which is, you know, people tend to put uh, TV and radio up against each other. But it's so interesting that in the majority of the film, when you see, um, you know, a lot of these films, uh, the action movies as well, they use radio for communication. So we are really the main character. And once they understand that, <laughs> then we will all celebrate our World Radio Day the same way um, but I, I'm really glad that you touched on uh, really the importance of celebrating a platform that is used across the board that needs no educational um, you know standpoint for the community to listen it needs no um, you know certain demographic you know radio is for everyone and I think you know as we're going to get into the panel discussion one of the most important elements of radio in Africa is language and the fact that we're able to speak to the people that we speak to in their respective language and then, you know, you, you get more grateful for, um, you know, certain guests like Marikano, who in Limpopo, you have to make sure that you accommodate uh, Chivenda, you have to accommodate Siperi, um, you know, to, the, uh, to make sure that we accommodate uh, our listeners. In Botswana as well, I'm sure it is the same thing, that the main, um, you know, language medium for communication is, um, you know, their respective languages in those countries. Um, but you know what, with that being said, um, let's see, Raphael, are you good to go? Oh, uh, the I, I still can't hear you. I think your laptop does not does not want you to speak and we are robbing us from greatness. <laughs> from West and I think you're oh, no. driving it. You can hear me now? Yes, amazing. Apologies and of course I'm very happy to be part of this meeting. And I uh, thank you very much to our guests. I have to mention that we are live here in Zambia on Radio 4. Uh, but we are also live on uh, TV too, and our you know um, various social platforms. Thank you very much for having me join in. Um, of course, there was that technical glitch that we experienced here, but I'm glad it's been sorted out. Uh, if I just uh, push in a question for uh, Madame Lorenzo Mata, if you don't mind, let me just in, uh, indulge you briefly. Uh, since the proclamation of um, you know, World Radio Day by UNESCO back in 2011 and its subsequent adoption by the UN General uh, you know, Assembly, as it were. Uh, what inroads, in your view, do you think radio has made in advancing the cause? I highlight this because it's so important to treat the root causes of violence and um, war, which may be uh, societal inadequacies, structural imbalances, poverty, uh, 
uh, land disputes or disputes for resources. Now we are seeing a lot for water, for example. So radio has this ability of dealing with these root causes before they scale up into a conflict, before they scale up into violence. And the same goes for the triggers of conflict or the triggers of war. Radio, because I said before, it's quick to react, it's quick to be on the spot, it's quick with just the microphone, can cover, for example, um, specific controversies or uh, sometimes uh, violence uh, up sur surges, uh, pops up in a certain neighborhood or in a certain uh, community, uh, there is tension. Uh, it, it can clarify frustration, it can clarify the clashes of interest uh, between different groups, and in that sense it is preventing conflict and it's preventing that violence will, uh, will explode. It, it also is able to identify issues of mistrust. So we have in, in, in Africa, we have glorious examples. There are so many I cannot really mention all. But for example, we had the Bush radio in South Africa many years ago. They had this uh, radio program um, handling the issue of the taxi gangs. I don't know if you remember. I, I think the program was called Taxi Talks. And they gave the microphone to one, to the gangs, one gang, the other gang, and to the listeners who were trapped, you know, you just wanted to take a taxi and you suddenly fell into a conflict of violence of gangs. And uh, and this ended up with a peace tre treaty, we can we say, between the gangs, and it was brokered by the radio station. We have in, in Uganda also, we have many, many cases of even local radio stations that have handled the issue of returnees and reconciliation. Because when they came back, knowing, the atro knowing themselves and the communities, the atrocities the demobilized soldiers had committed, some people in community wanted to stone them. I mean, they wanted to take revenge. Other ones wanted to welcome them back. So there was this radio station, which right now I don't remember the name. Could it be Base FM? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Who gave the word, who gave the microphone, gave the voice to the returnees to explain why they had taken up arms and gave the voice to the community to say why they didn't want them back. And, you know, this is the type of service that radio does, even at a humble level, even at a community level, but which makes us stop distrust, clear misunderstanding and go towards peace. So this is what we mean that radio is very important for conflict prevention and also for peace building. There are many other uh, examples. There, there was this uh, radio station, I think, also in Uganda that dealt with uh, these cases in which, um, this is many, many years ago, like 20 years ago, cases of people who wanted to take revenge with the neighbor or, you know, if I throw acid, if I, if I go and do this, what will happen to me? And in a very serious way, they had um, police in the panel, they had uh, politicians, uh, there was the journalist, and they explained, it was even an educational program, if you do this, this is what the law will do to that, to you, you know. Uh, so this is, these are the type of, 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 of things that, that counter the desire for revenge, that uh, the radio helps counter hate and, uh, and the will to go and take up arms. Marta, we thank you for that uh, amazing response. And I think with that being said, it's the perfect time now to introduce our uh, panelists and get into this discussion where we get to unpack, um, you know, radio and peace. Um, and, you know, it would be uh, great as well uh, for all of us to have our cameras on um, and uh, to prepare for this uh, discussion. Professor John, um, I'd like to uh, humbly request that you switch your camera on. 
um, I am breaking the stereotype that people uh, like to say that radio people only sound good. They don't look good. But uh, judging from my screen, we all look fantastic. <laughs> Berta, thank you so much uh, for giving us your time today. Uh, I'd like to release you. Uh, you have a lot of work to do and you still get to champion, um, you know, radio um, as the best platform, really, um, for non-propaganda uh, conversations and non-propaganda, um, you know, just... Non-propaganda, essentially. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for that. I would like to release you now and uh, begin uh, the conversation with the panelists. I'd like to hand over to um, my co-driver, the only car that has two steering wheels, <laughs> Raphael. Uh, I think let's introduce our panelist. All right. Um, I would like to actually hand the microphone to the uh, guests that we have. Um, let me begin with... Uh, Executive Director from PANOS, uh, Vosumizi Sifile. Uh, good morning and welcome to this discussion. Uh, thank, thank you, Raphael. Uh, good morning to you and good morning to everyone following this discussion. Great. Uh, could I now move on to uh, Madik, Madika? Um, please pardon me for mispronouncing your name, but uh, come in and uh, just say hello to our uh, audience. Um, hi, Rafael. I forgive you. You can try again. It's actually very simple. It's Madikana Machila. Good morning. Happy, happy, happy World Radio Day, team. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, most welcome, of course, to this discussion. Uh, I will do my best to get uh, Volin Gomani uh, from RX Radio. Uh, thank you very much and welcome to this discussion today. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for having me. Great. Uh, do we now have uh, Professor John Walia with us? Prof, are you there? Yes, I, I can hear you. I can see you. I'm not sure whether you can see me and uh, hear me. At the moment, we can't see you. It appears uh, perhaps uh, your camera is off. But uh, I see that you're active and welcome to this discussion, Professor. Thank you very much. I've put my camera on. Uh, I hope you'll be able to see me. But thank you so much yeah. for having me. Great, and of course, now we can see you for sure. Uh, we have uh, Madame Maribe from uh, Botswana Radio Tour with us. Good morning and welcome. A very good morning to you all. Um, I'm Osana Maribe from Botswana, Radio Botswana 2, RB2. Great. Uh, I think that will be all in respect to our guests for this morning. Uh, I would like to thank all of you, of course, for your presence. Uh, Nsako, that will yeah. be all right. Great. Uh, actually, uh, we're forgetting my colleague um, from, uh, we have the same home, Mr. Tommy Dixon, uh, who is the editor in news and current affairs from Channel Africa. Of course. Yes. <laughs> uh, good thank morning. You very much, uh, thank you very much, uh, Zago and Rafael. Thank you very much and, and good morning to all the colleagues and everybody who's listening. Yeah. Good morning, indeed. Uh, let's get the ball rolling. Of course, we, you know, <laughs> had very... Uh, insightful engagement uh, from uh, Marta Lorenzo and uh, thank you very much for, of course for your presence. Uh, we are also appreciating the fact that you still have a lot more to attend to today uh, in respect to World Radio Day. Um, allow me at this point to draw in uh, uh, Vosi from uh, Panos um, of Southern Africa. Help us appreciate what you're about as an organization and how you are helping to uh, contribute to really uh, capacity build uh, the uh, media houses that you work with, especially radio. Yeah, uh, th thank you so much, uh, Rafael. Yes, so uh, Panos Institute uh, Southern Africa is a communication for development organization. Uh, we are an organization that uses different uh, tools and platforms uh, to amplify voices uh, of poor and marginalized communities. And I think I have to mention from the onset that I think uh, radio is the platform that we predominantly use uh, for facilitating access to access to and use of information uh, by poor and marginalized uh, uh, communities. Uh, as you have rightly mentioned, uh, so we do a lot of work around uh, building the capacity of uh, uh, radio actors, radio and other media uh, professionals, but also uh, building the capacity of uh, media content uh, users yeah because the times you can have uh, very effective uh, platforms but if the uh, consumer side of things is not uh, well prepared you find that we may fail to realize the full value uh, that uh, radio uh, presents 
Well, I mean, of course, I couldn't agree with you more. We all appreciate at this point uh, that radio has evolved quite a lot from, uh, you know, uh, public owned to private or indeed commercial. We also now have community radio stations, uh, religious uh, radio stations as well. And there's always a possibility that, uh, you know, we could have untrained personnel uh, communicating with the masses. Uh, I would like to find out uh, from you, Vusi, is this something that possibly poses a risk uh, in how, you know, uh, radio personnel conduct themselves and potentially uh, foment conflict on account of uh, lack of understanding of, um, if you like, journalistic responsibility? Yeah, uh, th th thank you very much. I, I think, uh, like, uh, uh, Marta, uh, sorry for mispronouncing this thing, your, uh, our colleague uh, from uh, UNESCO, uh, did mention, I think, in terms of uh, the powerful role uh, and the unique role that uh, radio plays in terms of providing a platform for for engagement. And I think uh, we would not be commemorating World Radio Day without uh, the great work that uh, our colleagues who work in radio uh, are doing. So uh, and, uh, it is uh, like radio is driven by people, uh, the people behind uh, the microphones, the people behind the scenes, the people that most of the time we do not see, but we, uh, we, we hear. So yeah, it is uh, important looking at the powerful role that uh, radio has to play as our colleague already shared, that we have uh, the right people uh, helping radio to play that role. And uh, I think uh, the right people here, I don't mean only trained people, but people who have what it takes uh, to, be, uh, to be on radio. Uh, we have seen at times someone can be trained, but still uh, do stuff that is not uh, professional, but someone may be untrained, but because of the passion, because of the interest and other strengths, they can still uh, flourish. So, yeah, there are many dynamics, I think, that uh, uh, come into play. And uh, in my view, the most important thing for anyone working in or with radio uh, is to know, to understand the responsibility that uh, they carry. Uh, like uh, Mata uh, mentioned uh, that like radio is uh, undoubtedly uh, still one of the most widely used uh, mediums. And because of that, just one action of misconduct or just a, an act of mischief by someone on air can turn a whole nation uh, or a whole community uh, on fire. It can cause serious irreparable damage, but also just one uh, uh, I think we all know we have seen maybe cases uh, in in, uh, in Africa and elsewhere where there have been like outbreaks of xenophobia, outbreaks of uh, genocide and other undesirable situations, which in some cases would have been just because of one person on not two people, just one person on radio saying a, a wrong thing, just one wrong way it can literally distort uh, the whole thing. So it it is very important. Uh, for people that uh, work in radio and those that use radio to ensure that we have a very high level of uh, responsibility so that we are able to take advantage of the uh, power of radio to build uh, and not to, to destroy, to promote peace uh, and also to identify and prevent the spread of uh, hate speech, uh, disinformation, misinformation and other undesirable, uh, harmful or misleading content. Thank you very much. Nsako, would you like to probe him further? Um, actually, I had a question regarding, um, I, I think I'm interested in the world of conflict um, and, and what conflict actually means and the power of uh, presenters. Because, you know, I am a presenter myself and I know that whatever I say um, needs to come from a place of wisdom, understanding and fact. Um, as well. Uh, what have you seen um, happen um, in the past year regarding that? Do you think presenters understand their platform? Do you think we understand the role that we play? Or do we sometimes just enjoy hearing our own voices? And <laughs> let's be honest, um, from time to time, it's really enjoyable to hear your voice. But do you think from your perspective, we actually understand the platform that we have? Uh, I would say uh, mm -hmm. To some extent, there is uh, some understanding, 
but there is, uh, maybe I would say, there is room for improvement. Uh, I, I, <laughs> yeah, there is room for improvement in terms of uh, the extent to which uh, presenters understand their mandate, they understand their role. But of course, uh, we do understand that radio has evolved. It continues to uh, to change. Uh, earlier, Mata uh, spoke about uh, digital radio, or was it yourself? And like, we are living in an environment where the way people seek, share, and receive information is constantly changing and in a very fast-paced way. So you'd find that because uh, that presents a major challenge to you and other presenters because it means you also have to be constantly changing. You cannot be, uh, to borrow uh, maybe uh, without going religious, you cannot be the same yesterday, today, and forever as a, a presenter. You have to be constantly upgrading your knowledge, constantly upgrading your skills, constantly familiarizing with the platforms, because I am sure uh, the time that you, uh, sorry, Sarko, uh, put you on the spot, but the time that you have been on radio yourself, the gadgets that you are using now are probably not the same ones that you were using when you started. There are certain tools, there are certain platforms. So you find that, but if you do not invest in uh, developing yourself as a presenter, you may have a good voice, maybe a good appreciation of uh, certain issues, but you find that you fail to like live up to the expectation of uh, the audience, because even our audience, uh, the audience for radio is constantly uh, changing. So I think uh, there is a big challenge for radio presenters uh, and everyone that works in and uh, with radio to constantly uh, be adapting and uh, ensuring that this medium that we so love uh, remains relevant, it retains its power, even as there is all kinds of uh, other platforms that are emerging. I think for radio to retain its power, for radio to continue uh, being a symbol, a symbol or an expression of our peoplehood, it takes uh, uh, the people that work in uh, radio, colleagues such as yourself and uh, and Raphael. And uh, you mentioned that, uh, yeah, uh, yes, uh, I think when we hear something on radio, if uh, I meet Raphael on the street and he tells me something, I will believe him to some extent. But if he says it on air, I will believe him. 100%. So now imagine if what he is saying is not true, like how many people may easily be misled, how many people can easily be uh, like end up doing a wrong thing just because of a, a mispronouncement. So I think uh, maybe without speaking for too long, maybe just to emphasize that uh, as radio uh, personnel, uh, I think they, we, there is need to understand the educative uh, role that they have to play, to know that there are certain people who may not, like, be, uh, who will only learn about an issue only through radio. I think there are places, I have been to communities where people rely only on a particular radio station as their platform through which they learn about certain information. And if they don't hear it on radio, they may not hear it anywhere else. And also... I think uh, we need to look at radio as a gatekeeper or as a watchdog, preventing uh, the spread of harmful or misleading content in terms of preventing the spread of content that can uh, disturb peace or like the law enforcers will say, content that may cause a breach of peace. Yeah. So I think uh, radio has um, a very important role, but for that uh, to be sustained, it takes all of us to uh, to play our part. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vusmuze uh, Asifile. I think, uh, uh, Raphael, it's time we, uh, you know, cross over. I want to uh, speak to Yoli Angomani uh, from RX Radio. Uh, you know, it's quite interesting. Vusmuze uh, spoke a little bit about um, influence, and I think the generation that is influenced the most are the youth. And uh, Radio RX, uh, RX uh, Radio, rather, has taken a very unique, um, a child-centered approach um, to uh, your content. I I just want uh, us to just unpack that for a second um, and then we will move forward from there. You know, what is your approach with your content? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, RX Radio is a radio station that is by and for children. Um, it is the first of its kind in the world uh, to have child and young reporters with and without chronic conditions broadcast from within a hospital. We are situated in Red Cross Hospital, Cape Town, and we broadcast into other hospitals, Brooklyn Chest and Powell Hospital. Um, so basically, our content is influenced by the reporters themselves. Uh, they conceptualize their shows um, and they're trained in a basic uh, radio training that takes about five days. But in essence, they're the center uh, of it all and they come up with the topics, they choose the music that they want to hear on the radio um, and they dictate um, the conversation as, as they see fit. So basically, the vision of the station is just to have a, a space where we empower ourselves African children with voice and agency so they can um, exercise influence within the community and uh, the issues uh, facing them. I think that's absolutely brilliant. It actually reminds me of another online radio station. I think it's called Caps Radio as well. Um, they do um, the exact, uh, not exact same, but um, theirs is more about education and I really sense a sense of collaboration that could happen there. Um, and I want to pick up from that because if you are handing over the content um, that is for children to children, um, this is content, um, you know, by them. I think that is such a powerful way of teaching them that they each themselves have a platform, have a voice. Um, in our society, um, you know, what have been some of the, the challenges with that, um, uh, you know, communicating effectively, especially with young people and also young, be young people being heard as well? Mm. I think actually not necessarily challenges, I wouldn't say. So I think it's important for me to highlight that 80% of our reporters are children with chronic conditions. So that means as children with cancers, as children that have conditions that will never go away, right? And disabilities. Uh, and 20% as children, their friends and siblings that come support them during the first basic training. But I think what we've witnessed is actually an enlightenment of sort because now these children that have the chronic conditions are uh, slowly educating people um, or, or, or contributing to health promotion and health education where people are ignorant when it comes to people living with chronic conditions, especially disabilities. And uh, quite often in our societies, people that have difference, particularly disabilities, they are secluded in daily um, uh, dialogues. And children, uh, just in general themselves, they are usually in the backdrop. In radio, you get an hour of children broadcasting or a person that's already 18 and talking up uh, even a person 30 under their 30s 30 something just broadcasting for children but now for the first time they're the ones that are behind the mic uh, they have this power we call it the, it's the magic of the mic here at rx radio where now suddenly uh, there's the leveling of the playing field and children are able to interact uh, in this you can call it intergenerational dialogue where they are basically distracting, you know, um, the situation where children are usually in the backdrop and they're not integrated fully in discussions. Um, and then they they challenge uh, decision makers as well, right? And they've got uh, a common motif, rather, in their shows that speaks to health and also speaking to the upliftment of their voices. Uh, Raphael, uh, do you have any questions there? Yeah, sure, I do. And... Uh... Well, I mean, what you're doing is very admirable, uh, Ngomani and your team. I think that uh, your child-centered approach to programming is absolutely phenomenal, and I think it has to be encouraged. Um, I wonder if I could just hear this conversation somewhat differently. Um, we all understand radio's influence in uh, shaping and, uh, you know, um, modeling, you know, culture and uh, basically how society approaches uh, matters of uh, peaceful resolution of disputes. Um, just how critical do you think it is to engage the young people, the children, uh, to have conversations around vices of, uh, you know, ethnic clashes, um, tribalism, uh, religious intolerance and uh, things of that sort? Just how critical is it that a child or children are engaged in this sort of conversation to confront the status quo? It's very crucial because you'd remember that uh, children uh, 50 years down the line, you know, they will be the champions, right? And they will be the ones that are leading the conversation. So I think the sooner we uh, make uh, young people realize that uh, they have in them um, potential to be better 
uh, and also they are knowledgeable of subjects uh, that um, are part of uh, the day-to-day -day discussions. It's very important because I think, you know, 37 of our population in South Africa um, is about, uh, I think 37 of it is, is children, right? It's, it's, it's made up of children. So I think the sooner children are talking about mental health issues, the sooner the children are part of you know, discussions that have to do with war. Um, they understand the technicalities around poverty and, and they enlighten people. And also us with our health promotion and health education, so which is them breaking the stereotypical views that have been ongoing for years um, around difference is very important as well because they're shaping, you know, the, the perceptions that people need to have and, and how they would like to be addressed. So suddenly they are able at a younger age to morph a society that they would like to exist in and the earlier they do that then that means that possibilities of us you know being in agony and also people being you know um, um, judgmental and people not being able to be tolerant of others and um, those chances of those negativities are just slightly you know, you know cascading so I think for us to build those building blocks earlier, we are able to uh, create a society that has got uh, individuals that are, are informed, individuals that are able to interact, individuals that are able to understand their rights and also to challenge uh, things that or issues that they're not uh, happy with. So I think it's very important. And radio is a good um, start uh, as, as a platform where people can be confident and also can be informed uh, earlier on. I think that's brilliant. Um, you taking me back to my um, school days as well and realizing that radio was, you know, what we listened to on our way to school, on our way back. Um, you know, you just always felt like you were a part of this community. You felt like you were in the room with them. You just felt like you had friends that you've never met before. Um, and I think you're doing some very important work considering the fact that young people sometimes feel like their voice is not heard, feel like, um, you know, they do not have a platform um, for societal issues and their culture and you know also just establishing their confidence as um, as young people I think it's very very important the work that you're doing and we just want to appreciate you for that um, and also thank you for giving um, you know the young people as well who have been shunned by society um, those who are living with um, certain abilities and uh, those who do not have the same abilities um, so thank you for your platform um, I'd like to uh, move on um, uh, to uh, Mr. Tammy Dixon um, who is the editor of News and current affairs at Channel Africa. Um, you know, when it comes to news and current affairs, I think the other word for it is propaganda. Um, and especially with uh, Channel Africa, you know, we are driving the African perspective. You know, just, just starting off, um, you know, the conversation from there, you know, in your view, do you think we're owning and honing um, the African perspective uh, the right way? And this is not just us as Channel Africa, but this is, you know, every broadcaster in Africa. Do we understand the African perspective? Well, thank you very much, Tzako, uh, and your colleague, uh, Rafael. <clears throat> well, you, you are right. I mean, uh, being located in the African continent, it brings a huge responsibility to people who are on the radio because there are a lot of influences that are coming outside of the continent and some of the conflicts that we see in the African continent are actually sponsored conflicts. They are not uh, organic conflicts, uh, but they are sponsored by people who have different agendas who are coming from outside of the continent. And it's easy for them to use radio to be able to, to push for whatever agendas that they have and for whatever outcomes that they want to see. It could be political agendas or economic agendas. So as radio stations and or as media houses that are stationed in the African continent, it is important to ensure that the messages that we bring to our audiences uh, are not messages of gloom. Sometimes we have a lot of that from the uh, from the media houses that are not based in the African continent or that are not organically African. And 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 so the messages that they, they put across about the African continent uh, are messages of gloom and, and messages of an, an, a continent that that has no hope 
and and also they can actually maybe they are trying to get a hold of the resources that we have in the African continent and it's easy for them to foment conflicts using radio and 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 it's easy for them to even plant people and we talked earlier on about uh, people who are on the radio so the credibility of people who are on the radio is, is becomes very very important that's why in, in news and current affairs we make sure that we screen people you we've got to screen people who who come on on the radio so that we know that who are these people there's a lot of dishonesty out there people who are carrying different agendas people who are embedded with with different organizations that have different agendas so it is important to screen people who come into the radio especially on news and, and current affairs so that we don't we don't uh, sit with a problem of people who claim to be journalists or reporters yet they're working for some donors out there or working for some uh, civil society organizations who carry different agendas or in some instances people uh, reporters who are working even for political organizations and political elites uh, that foment uh, conflicts in the african continent because they want to achieve certain political outcomes so so in in in, in news it becomes very very critical in terms of who are the carriers of information and do these people understand the whole concept of of uh, looking at developments in the african continent through an african perspective because we we like i said i mean we there's, there's now a huge uh, spotlight in the african continent we're not the only ones uh, even in, in terms of radio or just the media in general we're not the only ones who are operating now in the african continent there's a huge interest in the story of the african continent from media houses that are coming from outside of the of the african continent we know already of i don't want to mention names but i'm sure we do know, know the names of massive media institutions that are based in the in the continent already and they, they are no longer sending people now to the african continent to get information and send it out and distort it and twist it and, and, and all of that but now they are bringing resources within the african continent to be here, to be with us here, so that they get this information firsthand. And also they are looking for the ears of the population of the African continent uh, in order to be able to spread these messages that they want to spread about the African continent. So radio becomes, in as much as we, have all, we all agree that it is a great tool for information, um, for peace building and so on, but radio also plays, it, it's a, like a double-edged sword it can be used quite successfully by people who, who, who drives different agendas. And the conflicts are actually in the African continent, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, um, they, they become more, more entrenched because people use the, uh, the platform of radio. I mean, I was reading the, the, the article as part of my research that in the conflict in Liberia in the, in the mid 90s, one of the problems there was that the former president there, uh, Charles Taylor, was owning media, media platforms. He had radio stations and newspapers that he was owning, and they, they were using those um, um, to, to be able to, to advance whatever agenda that they have, which actually led to the killing of many, many people. This is the problem we see throughout uh, the African continent as well, in terms of the control of the media. Uh, the control of the media is an issue, and in some of the conflict situation in the in the African continent, it is it is is it is as a result of the the state controlled media and 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 which is used which they use to be able to advance their political agenda. So it's 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 something that is quite very important that we are raising Zako, about how we view ourselves and how are we looking ourselves as as African people. And and one one of the one of the sources of this challenge is that is in the news, because the 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 the, the information that comes out that comes in, we have to send people out there to bring that information. And if those people who are bringing that information are not credible themselves, you run a risk now of actually disseminating that information through radio, that is going to, you know, create a lot of conflict out there. So we, you, you've got to be very clear about the, the information that you bring into the radio station and how you package it in order to pass it on to your, 
to your to your to your listeners because radio has uh, has 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 as a potential and to 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 influence you know public opinion and also how you frame that information is also quite important because sometimes the conflict is as a result of how stories and how issues in our society are being framed so the framing of the news itself is is quite critical how do you frame it in such a manner that it does not spark uh, tensions it does not create and so that you you, you don't um, and, and make the situation worse than it, it already is. So that, that's I think that's that's what we I think we need to 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 be aware of and, and make sure that those of us who who sit in a position of gatekeeping in radio to make to make sure that we we clean up the content. We don't just pass content to the audiences um, without making sure that we we scrutinize it and make sure that it is a it is a content that. That is not going to create tensions and create conflicts uh, in our people. Yeah. Raphael? Well, I mean, very interesting uh, insights that you have shared, uh, Tammy. And um, well, with everything that you just stated, I'd like to draw in, uh, uh, you know, our colleague, Moset Sana Maribe, uh, station manager for uh, Radio Botswana 2. Uh, given the, the the, the interest in, uh, of course, uh, coming up with uh, the various uh, media houses driving their own agendas. How do we remain relevant as a traditional, uh, you know, medium of communication so that we advance the peace that we all desire to have? Uh, are we still, you know, are we still really uh, playing that role as effective? I know that uh, you have been in the industry for a long time. 1965 is a long time. Uh, what have you seen change in the landscape of uh, radio programming, for instance? Thank you very much. Um, let me just say, um, as the Department of Broadcasting Services in Botswana, we run three television channels and two radio stations. One being the Radio Botswana, um, the one which was uh, started broadcasting in 1965. And then we also have Radio Botswana 2, which started broadcasting in 1992. Uh, Radio Botswana, the main one that started broadcasting in 1965. Um, it mainly, or oh, for the longest time, has been broadcasting um, to the whole nation because for quite some time it was the only radio station in the country. Uh, we, we do have uh, private radio stations now, which are almost the same age as Radio Botswana 2. But for the longest time, Radio Botswana was the only radio station that was broadcasting. It was mainly broadcasting um, government policies and uh, programs. And over time, it has been seen as being a very reliable source of information. Even if there is um, a, um, breaking news in these smaller radio stations, people will wait for the main bulletin of Radio Botswana to confirm whether it's the, the, the right information. Um, what we have been doing right is we are very cautious with the information that we give out to to the nation and we in being cautious it doesn't mean that we don't allow people to say whatever they want to say most of our programs are discussions with guests and balanced uh, all parties represented we also do for those programs do call-ins where we allow um, the nation to participate. And I should also note that this is a radio station that broadcasts for the whole of Botswana. Uh, all Botswana can, can, can access it um, and Radio Botswana too as well. So that is what we, uh, we do well. We are very big on, on gatekeeping. Uh, 
not to say we don't allow a, a wider range of topics. We do. Um, Radio Botswana 2 is, 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 is mainly commercial. Uh, so it competes with um, most of the private radio stations. And it's mainly very quick and wanting to stay relevant at the same time. So the main Radio Botswana is the one that is mainly for uh, the wider population and mostly being trusted by most of our senior citizens uh, around the country. I don't know if I answered your question. Well, you have. And um, I, just to, you know, uh, ask a little further, how mm -hmm. therefore are you uh, maintaining First of all, if you are competing in the space where private media stations are also thriving, uh, there's always the temptation to try and uh, keep up with the Johnsons, if you like. How do you manage to stay afloat and at the same time retain your role as a gatekeeper so that you do not compromise, for instance, uh, you know, the, the peace culture that Botswana is known for? Um, as a nation, we, 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 I think it's something that works um, that we it's in our character as as a nation we operate under a principle of consultation we are whether in the traditional setup or the governance at the moment we we are a nation that consults so we 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 even it this also even translates in our 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 programming we at the moment have been looking at uh, what you're saying that um most of the people who are now older uh, were younger by we don't want to really we want to to to, to keep the the trust that people have in it but at the same time we we were in the process of looking at it and um, making it relevant, but not taking a lot from it, because we are running the, the sister one, which is commercial. We, are, we don't want to take it into the commercial sector because it serves the nation. Uh, Radio Botswana 2 is the one that is doing commercial and running with the competition of the other of the private uh, uh, broadcasters well thank you very much uh, we will be obviously uh, engaging uh, uh, modikana in a short while but we do have uh, of course professor john walia from uh, the gamma shoot uh, institute for uh, conflict and uh, peace studies uh, here in uh, zambia uh, from the copper belt university um Professor, just share with us your institute's core values in respect to peaceful uh, resolution of disputes. Well, thank you very much uh, um, for having me. And uh, as you rightly mentioned, I'm coming from the Doug Hammarskjöld Institute for Peace and Conflict Studies. The name itself uh, suggests to you that uh, um, we are named after Doug Hammarskjöld, who was a Secretary General of the UN, who died here in Zambia in a plane crash. And uh, he was on a mission uh, for peace in the Congo. So our focus is really about uh, advancing the ideals of uh, um, uh, peace, peace building, uh, conflict prevention, and everything that uh, would promote uh, harmony, whether it's at community level, at uh, personal level, as well as uh, um, the national and international level. So, um, we are very strong on uh, teaching, of course, because we are found in a, in a university. Uh, so, we teach uh, uh, students who become ambassadors of, uh, of peace. Uh, they, will be in, uh, they will be working in uh, non-government organizations, in government institutions, or they are working on by themselves, or academics who contribute to research, uh, again, around uh, peace building. 
We are also big on uh, uh, seminars and conferences, short courses. Um, we've organized uh, many high-profile um, uh, international and national conferences uh, on peace building, on xenophobia, on uh, ethnicity and conflict, politics, elections, all those things that uh, uh, are conflict generating. Uh, we we speak about those uh, uh, those matters. So really, we are involved in teaching, in research, and uh, uh, in seminars as well as short courses. That's uh, basically the role of uh, the Dagamashot Institute for Peace and Conflict Studies. Okay. And maybe I should say it's important to know uh, where we're coming from because we're not just uh, it's not just an academic unit in the university. Uh, the formation of uh, the Dagamashot Institute uh, is, was uh, um, initiated uh, by the UN country team, United Nations country team, and uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Government of the Republic of Zambia. Uh, so we are an organ that has uh, emerged from a uh, very uh, high level uh, of interest in peace building. I just want to come in there. Um, you know, peace is a, there's a, a huge philosophy behind peace, a very personal one. Um, and it looks different for everybody. Peace um, to someone may look like having a very full bank account. Uh, peace to someone else may look like running on a field full of tulips. Um, and then peace to another person may just be that violence itself. Um, I want us to unpack what peace looks like um, in, in, in African countries um, and in Africa. Um, why I'm asking this question is because I want us to get into what we as broadcasters need to communicate about peace. Um, and I think that comes with the understanding of what it needs to look like. Um, um, does it look like coexistence? Does it look like a genuine appreciation of a different country? Does it look like, um, you know, better trade relations? What does peace look like from the African perspective? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, that's a big question. What does peace look like uh, in an African context? Uh, let me begin it this way. Really, when we're talking about peace in broad terms, we're talking about harmony. Uh, now, that harmony uh, begins with an individual. Uh, you have to have peace uh, as an individual to be able to contribute to peace in a community and peace uh, in, 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 in the world. So, uh, when, when, and there's, there are quite a number of uh, variables that can contribute to individual peace. You've talked about a bank account or your food and all those things can uh, influence or can, can affect the, the, the status of peace of an individual. And the status of peace even in a community, if a community is hungry, uh, it's very difficult to uh, see that uh, you will see, you, you observe peace, where people have faced uh, uh, starvation or threat uh, to their lives because they don't have the basic necessities. We have seen on the African continent uh, riots and uh, looting and things like that, which disturb the harmony. So, from an individual level, if uh, we have uh, peace and we have all the variables that contribute to attaining peace, then we'll be, we can transition to the community. Uh, but I think it's also important to note that uh, generally on the African continent, when we talk about peace, even globally, uh, those who do research and studies in peace will, will tell us that uh, there is negative peace, there is positive peace. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can have negative peace because there is no visible, audible uh, evidence of, uh, of conflict or even war. But in actual fact, in people's minds, in people's hearts, there is something that is eating them. And that is where institutions of government sometimes they make a mistake. They hush the people, they hush the discontent. And uh, when people don't uh, act, they think they've attained peace. But people are just bottling uh, the, 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 the tension. And when that is bottled at, at some point, it may just erupt and you wonder, where did this come from? There has been, uh, there has been what looked like peace, but it was just negative peace. But we should transition, Africa must transition to, to enhancing positive peace, where 
indeed you have peace. You know, when you say people are not complaining, indeed they are at peace with themselves, they are at peace with uh, their neighbor and peace with uh, everybody else. So I would say to, to, to a large extent on the African continent, we see a lot of negative peace. Mm. And I think you, you hit a, <laughs> the nail on the coffin there because I think about, you know, where I, I currently am in South Africa, um, where I, I feel there's a negative piece that's building up, you know, the power cuts that take place here, um, you know, the lack of service delivery sometimes that we get to experience. Um, and, you know, sometimes you look at the people and you think, oh, are we being too dormant? Are we being too relaxed? Are we being too calm about this? Um, but now you've put a really a solid name on it, negative piece. Um, and I want to come back to that because I think our leaders are play a very big role um, if they're not the core of some of the uh, peace relations or, or the peace um, that happens in our, 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 our countries. What is the biggest misconception about conflict resolution in African countries? Well, uh, again, the biggest, uh, um, you know, when we use the, the, the term uh, uh, conflict resolution, when you resolve, you are saying the conflict is completely ended. It is not going to recur. It has been resolved. Whatever it is that was uh, uh, causing that conflict has been dealt with. Um, but the, so the, the, the misconception has always been uh, to think, as I said, the negative pace without going deeper to see that the grievances that people might have had have been addressed. The alienation that people must have felt, which could have contributed uh, to their resorting to violence or even war, have been addressed. So the issue is, are we addressing the real issues uh, that cause people uh, to erupt into violence? In fact, when I use erupt uh, uh, guidedly, because it, it's not just that it erupts suddenly and we didn't know. There are always telltale signs. And I think uh, the panelists here have indicated that, you know, that's where radio comes in. Uh, you'll be able to deal with some of the potential or uh, uh, things that are indicating that in the future, if they are not addressed, uh, they could lead to violence or even war. So it is important for all our leaders uh, to really interrogate, think beyond just uh, power, uh, beyond their term of office, uh, to think about legacy, think about uh, the next generation, what, how will this impact our children? So when we deal with the uh, problems, we really resolve, to use your word now, we resolve the conflict. Uh, they, they, they are different. Go ahead, bro. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. So there, there, are, there, are, there, there are different uh, thinkers who have contributed to this and uh, how, how really we can build uh, um, lasting peace. Okay, I've seen you t we talk about durable peace so that uh, things don't recur. Um, some talk about uh, conflict transformation uh, so that uh, when, when, the, when the conflict is resolved, you don't see a loser. Okay, because sometimes when we want to resolve a conflict, we think. I don't know if it's just on my side. I might have lost Prof there. Um, well, I have lost him too. So maybe there's a bit of difficulty in uh, connectivity. Well, Prof, are you with us? Okay. It would appear we've lost him momentarily and uh, we'll be reverting to him, of course, as we go along. Uh, very interesting insights that he gives us. And of course, I still have uh, maybe one or two questions to put to Professor, but I'll be reverting to him as and when, of course, the connectivity is uh, cleared out. Uh, there's a guest we haven't spoken with yet, and I know he has such, uh, you know, uh, a lot of experience and wealth of information regards, uh, you know, the media landscape. And now that we're discussing uh, radio and peace, I would like to, um, you know, get thoughts uh, from uh, uh, Modikana, if he's still with us. Um, th uh, thanks, Rafael. I, I oh, am great. here. Yeah, I am great. here. Nice yeah, it's quite, it's yeah. quite unfortunate that we lost Prof um, because he was uh, really picking up some interesting points when, when, when coming to peace. Um, look, I think, I, I think maybe just as a, maybe just as a precursor to this study, let me just start off firstly by uh, profiling the SABC's radio division. 
It is led by um, a lady called uh, Nara Wachela, who is the uh, GE uh, for this unit. The SABC radio division boasts for 19 radio stations. 11 of these radio stations broadcast in African languages, um, South African languages, and these are uh, the 11 official languages that you find in the, in, in the Constitution. And of these 11 radio stations, and then you have Channel Africa, of course, that features a number of African languages also in the different services that, um, that we, we, we feature. What is interesting about the radio division for the SABC is that it boasts for 70% 70, 70 of your market share, um, leaving competition to only play in the 30%. So um, I'm not sure if you, you would want to call it a monopoly, but in terms of delivering the services and, and finding reach, the SABC is really um, a market leader when it, comes to, when it comes to that. One of the key goals for the SABC is to become a credible voice of the continent. So the discussion about peace, peacekeeping, this theme itself um, speaks very highly of what the SABC is trying to achieve for this country and for this continent. But I think it will be um, quite interesting to see how, you know, um, apart from just delivering mandate, how the SABC contributes into the bigger agenda of positioning Africa uh, properly. I mean, you heard what Tammy said in, in terms of telling African stories, and it's something that has been missing, the narrative itself. Um, it's something that you know a lot of people have put in terms of discussion. Where does it go, and how how does it position Africa and African continent, uh, and 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 the diaspora? But three things really that I want to look at um, and and actually position in in terms of this discussion. And this is the role that radio plays. I think one. Radio has the audience, and we spoke so much about issues of trust and issues of reliability. Yeah, that that's the first one. You can't build any communities, you can't build any structures if people don't trust you. And for people to trust you, you've got to be this reliable person, this reliable body that everyone needs to connect with. So that's the first one. I think and over time, radio has built that, the reliability and the trustworthiness that has come out of the news, out of the programs, and everything else that has to do with radio. Secondly, the, the community-centric nature of radio. Radio is about conversations, about dialogue. Um, in, in the many areas where you see there's unrest, where there's no peace, where there's uh, a community protest, anything of that nature, radio has been that only medium that creates dialogue, connects the different role players. I mean, you can talk about government, you can talk about civil society, you can, you can talk about the community members themselves. It's, it's been through radio that we create those dialogues and we are able to talk about the resolution issues. Of course, these are um, at a different level. Last but not least, the, the personal nature of radio, and this is something that is sitting particularly with the audience, with the listeners, with the stakeholders of radio. They own it. Where, where they are, this medium belongs to us. So if this medium belongs to us, we trust it, we rely on it, and we, we fight for it you know, in terms of protecting it. There's a number of things that you can talk about um, when you, you come to the personal nature of radio. It's about, it's about me. I mean, one of the biggest challenges, one of the biggest flex that um, over the years people have, have, uh, have, have spoken about um, and, and predicting as to be the death of radio has been music. And a lot of people who love and follow music have listened to the radio for that companionship. Uh, and, and, and you can't take that, that away from radio. But look at how radio has transformed. Look at how radio has brought in all of these elements. We call them technological uh, divide, to call it community unrest, Call it conflict. Radio has been that one medium. We can even call it the chameleon of, 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 of the universe. The one medium that has been able to connect all the dots to make sure that there is that dialogue because of these uh, uh, three things that I've pointed out. I'm, I'm most interested to pick up on, uh, you know, the fact that you're using 11 official local languages, and I think that is uh, uh, very key. I wonder, from your perspective, how do you manage to stimulate positive conversations to confront, uh, you know, issues of xenophobia, xenophobia for instance, uh, which, I mean, in any case, uh, has been manifest in South Africa, uh, also, you know, in the uh, Eastern Asian region. Um, those may sound a little unique uh, situations to yourselves and maybe other parts of the world. We in Zambia, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda and many other parts of Africa are still grappling with issues of tribalism. Uh, how are you stimulating positive conversations to challenge this status? 
Uh, look, that's exactly where it's sitting with the radio programming. I and mean, I spoke about how re- radio has a bigger element of trust. Now, maybe let's just draw it a little bit closer to home. This issue of tribalism, this issue of social cohesion. If you look at uh, the, the, the world uh, um, structure now in terms of some of the ailments that people are coming across, one of them is social cohesion. Social cohesion has been one across all societies. We battle social cohesion as, as, a, as, a, as a people. And we've seen how radio, you know, in its truest form, in its culture, in its nature, has been able to connect different cultures. Um, I'll come to Limpopo, where I'm based. Uh, there's three radio stations here, all in the SABC, Chobala FM, Mungana, and Parakala FM. All of these radio stations serve three uh, different cultural groups, you know, and, 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 and over the years, you've seen racial tensions, you've seen tribal tensions. But because you have radio, you are able to facilitate conversations across. But over and above that, you're sitting also in a decade um, that UNESCO has declared, uh, a decade of indigenous language, where we are able to celebrate the amount of impact that this radio station has put together in terms of broadcasting. You've got listeners that um, range from illiterate to well advanced, uh, if, if, if there is that kind of a comparison. But for the bigger part of your illiterate, semi illiterate um, uh, listeners, those that uh, would not even want to use English as a medium of instruction, You've got the indigenous languages, you've got Sepet, you've got Shitonga, you've got Isizul, for instance, to connect with those. I mean, um, um, Ukozi FM, for instance, is, is, is the only radio station in this country that reaches um, 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 over almost 8 million listeners. You know, you know, and that's something that you don't see also in the continent. What, what does that tell you? You know, it tells you that there's, um, there's, there's a lot of power in terms of communicating with people in their language. And we can quote, you know, from different speakers. We can quote from Tata as well, who once said, if you communicate uh, with people in their language, the messaging goes to their heart. But if you communicate with them in English, it goes to their head. So we've been seeing how, you know, the, the, the use of African languages has transformed the SABC. We've seen how it has transformed different communities because you speak to them in a language that they understand. They are even part of these conversations because this is not a one uh, way kind of uh, m- 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 messaging, but it's also, you know, some form of a, a um, an interaction where people are able to follow and comprehend what you're saying as a presenter, what you're saying as a radio station and be part of those conversations. I want to link um, two events here. Um, Prof spoke about, and Prof, we're so glad to have you back. Um, you know, Prof spoke about, you know, a negative piece um, that was taking place, which was also caused by uh, different inequalities uh, within communities. Where you're situated, Marigana, is probably 100 kilometers, 98 kilometers at most, um, away from a different African country, uh, being Zimbabwe. Um, and, you know, the relations between the two uh, countries, um, you know, has been something that I feel uh, needs to be worked on. Um, and, you know, on, on that note, we had a recent event where, um, you know, where negative peace really did manifest because we saw um, a lot of Zimbabweans are going into Limpopo trying to access, um, you know, better health uh, services uh, for themselves. And that's causing a row um, for uh, Limpopoans who felt that, you know what, but we cannot access our own, uh, um, you know, health services because of overcrowding and inequality. And, you know, that came into play and we, you know, began to see an almost, um, you know, war between the two to say, you know, how do we, you know, open the border and allow our African brothers and sisters to access better health, but at the same time, making sure that there's enough space for us. I want to ask you, what was the the common trend for radio uh, presenters and broadcasters when that event was taking place? What was the messaging specifically? Look, I, I ran away, Rafael, deliberately from answering this xenophobic uh, discussion question, because, I mean, for me, I think it's quite big. It needs a, a different platform. Um, but just to be specific on the question that you're asking, um, about the messaging from radio is very. Uh, um, the 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 border gate from Botswana into into Limpopo it's not even 98 case. Uh, the same also in terms of Zimbabwe. You know, we just just we we, we neighbors and we do all of these things together. I and mean, there's a lot of spillage of the three radio stations that you have here in the province in Zimbabwe and Botswana as well. Um, there's a little bit of radio too, also in South Africa, that you know people around the areas of Lepalala are able to listen. But what is the messaging? What is the the, the core of it um, that you're driving as a radio broadcast? It's content. You know, we, you're sitting here at a Musina Makara Special Economic Zone, where the activities um, for people traveling into South Africa and out of South Africa into the continent generates a lot of revenue for this country. 
and the borderline countries, Botswana, um, Zimbabwe, and, 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 and the like. So from where we were sitting, you, you, you know, you, you, you are sitting with a, a bit of a communication challenge, but our programming, we've got calendars that are, Travel FM calendars that are in Zimbabwe, couple of calendars that are now in Zimbabwe. We've got calendars that are Travel FM that are now in Botswana. So our messaging has always been very simple. We are neighbors. Um, we've got what we call developmental program when we talk about how um, crossing into South Africa from Botswana benefits South Africa and crossing into uh, Botswana from South Africa benefits um, benefits um, um, the other countries as well. But to be honest with you, issues of xenophobia um, are very sensitive when it comes to messaging. So our messaging has always been that of brotherhood. Um, if there are spillages, if there are issues of xenophobia, let them be addressed at a, at a different forum. But with us, the messaging has been You know, we need to uh, see how we trade together. We need to see how we share talent. We need to see how we collaborate better as the different countries. I mean, you've got a, a huge number of um, uh, Zimbabwean migrants in Limpopo, but we've not seen any acts of uh, xenophobia as much as you people suspect that you see them in the d different parts of this country. Um, so that's why I'm saying the issues about xenophobia really, I think, would need a different discussion. But our messaging in terms of radio has been that of power, has been that of collaboration, has been that of celebrating Africa. I'm like now, today is World Radio Day. We're connecting with Radio Mozambique. We're connecting also um, with uh, with uh, with Zambian uh, um, radio stations just to see how you know the communication element in terms of radio have been quite big uh, from where we're coming from in South Africa. So it's positive messaging. Yes. Okay. Positive messaging, absolutely critical. Uh, we now have a Professor back uh, here with us, and uh, you're most welcome, Professor. Uh, you were stressing, uh, you know, some points just before the line, unfortunately, cut. I'd like to find out from you, as a stakeholder in advancing peace, Professor, what is your perspective of how media and radio especially uh, can effectively be used as a tool to resolving conflicts? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and maybe just retracing, I think it's good that we are focusing on this, uh, this year's theme uh, is focusing on radio and peace. But I think Tammy made a very fundamental uh, contribution uh, about uh, radio as a tool. Now, because it is a tool, it really depends on in whose hands is it. And uh, the, the, the person who has the radio and has intention to do harm, I can use the same radio to uh, create conflict. Uh, but if, if the one who has the radio, who is holding the microphone, who has power over the airwaves, is in, intending to build peace, to prevent conflict, that is exactly what is going to happen. And we have both examples on the African continent. We've had the radio stations which have been, uh, uh, which have contributed to uh, human rights abuse and a lot of uh, conflict. But also we have many radio stations, including yourselves. Uh, I've had opportunities to live in Botswana and I've also had opportunities to live in South Africa. And uh, I was listening to radio in both countries. And even here in Zambia, I listen to radio a lot. And I want to give you an example. In 2020, uh, we partnered with ZNBC, which is a radio, uh, Zambia, Zambian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, we had a 13-week program uh, where we were talking about uh, issues of, uh, because what affects us in our local, even in the rest of Africa, is these ethnic differences. We were trying to unpack people understanding. So radio plays a very important role in education. So our part was to educate ourselves, share our education. Really, people pride themselves in that I belong to this tribe. But do they even understand what the word tribe means? So we, we started to look at uh, the sociological understanding of tribe. Really, it's not as complementary as we might want to think. Okay, because it simply refers to a non-primitive group of society or group of people that belong to a certain uh, uh, language grouping and they are ruled by a particular chief, they stay in a particular area. So from the sociological point of view, looking at a very primitive group of people. So it's like if you say, what is my tribe? It's as, as if you are saying, what, what group of primitive people do I belong to? You know, to put it uh, very crudely. So we, 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 we tried to help us understand that some of the things that we, we try to cling on so much may not even mean what we, we think they do. So 
uh, that was the whole series. So we begin to partner with uh, institutions like yourself. So the, your question again, um, really, the institutions, I want to again see uh, in that question ourselves as the Dhaka Mashad Institute for Peace and Conflict Studies. We recognize that uh, radio as a platform and building on Tamil's words uh, is a tool that can be used significantly, powerfully uh, to promote peace, uh, to build society. And we have seen in places where there have been the conflicts and in the post-conflict uh, uh, period where, you know, when there's a conflict, there's a lot of mistrust. Uh, people don't trust each other in the community. Everyone is a, is a suspect that they're going to cause some, uh, some harm to you. People even lose trust in, gov in institutions of government. If people lose trust in the police and in the army because these are the people who are bringing a lot of harm. So, uh, radio begins to build bridges through programming. The kind of programs that are deliberately uh, put up, they begin to build or mend relationships, reconciliation, uh, negotiation. And people begin to have a dialogue. You know, when people are fighting, when there's a breach of peace, people are not talking to each other. So radio provides a platform for dialogue. And in peace and conflict uh, uh, discourse, dialogue is very important. That people begin to talk to one another. Uh, they are being heard. Uh, so it, it radio provides a very big platform uh, which uh, resonates with uh, the conflict prevention uh, uh, steps that we normally would take. Um, I, I'll leave it there, but you can ask if there's a, a, something I've missed. I want to come in there and ask, uh, pass a question through to Yolingo Mani, who um, is championing the youth um, uh, in uh, broadcast media uh, through RX Radio uh, South Africa. Are we teaching young people um, about uh, conflict resolution, or should we actually take a step back and listen to them about uh, how to resolve uh, a conflict? I think um, what, what I'm hearing from Prof as well is that it's not the most complicated things um, that resolve our conflict. Uh, if anything, it is the, the simple things that we need to do. However, um, I think as adults, you know, a lot of things come into play, ego, um, um, you know, our own educational backgrounds and wanting to almost outdo uh, one another. What can we learn from the youth regarding our conflict our resolution or rather conflict our transformation as our prof has referred? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so I think what adults tend to do, they want to speak on behalf of young people, uh, specifically children, and uh, don't want to listen with an intent to integrate them in the dialogue. So I think it's very much important to bring young people to the center so that you can understand the dynamics and uh, the technicalities that they want to bring forth for renewing you know, the old forms and also speaking to policies. For instance, here in the hospital, uh, the radio station has allowed children uh, since they're the primary clients of the hospital, um, to speak to the service that's rendered to them. That's through the programming that we've done. To an extent, um, there's been an improvement in policy development here in the hospital. So I think the, the moment children are given or young people a chance to vocalize their views, they didn't surprise you um, in that um, they give you exactly what you want as you want it and and i think what's also important is that in that process um there's a room where um we are able uh you know the elderly and and the young are able to integrate each other in in the spaces that they exist in so i think there's a lot of enlightenment that happens there and peace as well for instance uh, there's a room for learning and and also there's room to allay fears because people tend to assume that they know you know what the other person is thinking without having a dialogue and i think that's what professor is saying that in dialogue that's when we learn and then that's when we understand how the other person processes um you know the day to day and i think it's very important then to open those opportunities, especially for people that have been secluded for quite a while, uh, for them to turn the narrative and, and, and address things that are, you know, important to them. And everyone in that will be able to learn. And um, yeah, that's what I think. 
Thank you for that response. Thank you. Rafael? Um, I would like to draw in uh, Tammy. Uh, you really spoke passionately about the need uh, for, you know, um, African media houses to fully appreciate their role uh, vis-a-vis, -vis, yeah. of course, a preservation of who we are as a people. Uh, I wonder what would be your recommendation in respect to how do we allow the private media, for instance, to play out at the same time, uh, bring in a regulation that uh, helps to keep everybody else in check? Yeah, no, that's that's a great point, <clears throat> because really, the that's the issue in in the African continent when it comes to media, it's really about control of the media itself by extension the radio stations. Because um, if you don't check that, then you're going to it's going to be easy to romanticize the radio, right? Uh, you can romanticize it because, like, like I said earlier on, in itself, radio is fine. I mean, you can do whatever you want it to do. It depends who controls it at the end of the day. It depends on, on the people who are there controlling it. I mean, look, look for instance, at the station that I work for, Channel Africa. It has a history of having been started by the apartheid government. They had a reason why they did that. You know what I mean? They established it because they had they wanted to glorify their own apartheid system to make it to look good. You know what I mean? To to sell it to other outside countries that whatever that's happening under apartheid in South Africa, it's all good. Nobody should worry. We are fine. And this 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 happens elsewhere in the African continent as well. And 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 that is why you see um, the private radio stations or private media, they are repressed. There's a lot of suppression of, of private radio stations because the, the messages that they are carrying is not compatible with what the political elite in some African countries, they want to see. And, and so it's, it's a challenge. So we, 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 we need not romanticize too much what radio does. There, there's, there's some radio stations also in the African continent that operate in very hostile environment. Even some simple projects of peace building, you know, of bringing people together in communities to say that you are trying to, to form peace and build peace and so on. Even those programs themselves cannot be sustainable in a hostile environment where the radio itself is, is used by the political elites and to advance their own political agendas. So the environment within which radio operates is a key issue. In countries where there's peace and democracy, like South Africa and elsewhere, maybe, it's fine. You know what I mean? We can say whatever we want to say. You can come on radio and do whatever you want to do, bring pro uh, programs and so on. But in, in countries where they operate under a very hostile environment, and whatever, there, there are some critical factors. Those are critical factors that are actually militating against any potential progressive role that can that that radio can play. So so the the issue of having private media or private role or private radio is important. It's quite important because it assists to ensure that the, the credibility of your message. Because radio stations that are controlled by governments in Africa unfortunately have no credibility in the eyes of of, of people. They, they have no credibility. I mean, look at what happened in Zimbabwe. I mean, during the crisis of the political, the political crisis there in around 2008 as a result of the, of the, uh, the election conflicts there. I mean, um, a lot of radio stations were closed, newspapers were closed because the message they're carrying out and is not compatible to the messages that those are in power want to see happening in society. So it's very, very important the issue of who controls actually this, this radio station? Who controls it? Because that determines the message that you're going to get out of that radio station. It also determines who's going to be employed in that radio station. And, 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 and obviously those people will be the conduits um, of the messages that seeks to probably destroy and loot. And you, know, you, and, and you have a situation now and when you are on radio, you can't talk about corruption that is done by government people. You can't. 
Otherwise, you're going to lose your job. You can't ask difficult questions to politicians. No, you can't ask the president that question. No, you can't ask minister so-and-so that question. You know what I mean? Because, because if you do that, you're going to lose your job. You know what I mean? So you 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 have to comply and and toe the line. It's uh, because the the radio station that you are working for is actually controlled by the very same people who pay you. Mm. You see, this is the challenge. So the the question of private media that you are raising is very very important. That the African continent needs to create space for a media that is not state controlled. There's there's no other way. And and. In countries where there's peace and, and democracy, maybe we may not understand this, but in countries where there's conflicts, it, it is a big thing because the quality of the message that comes from such institution is discredited. It's totally discredited. And you, 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 those people, they have no interest, even if they want to build peace, and that peace, it must be peace that actually help to sustain their own programs. So that's not peace. So they're, they're suppressing people. You may think that there's peace because there's no violence, there's no action, and yet people are suppressed to create a, a you know what I mean, a, a false situation that there's peace, and yet people are, and people are suppressed so that they're not, they don't get to know what's going on and they don't get to voice their own opinions and so on about what's going on in their countries. So the role of media that is not controlled by the state is very, very critical so that people can be able to say what they want to say. Even citizens can be able to call into the radio without being told, no, 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 close that and, and you know, uh, close that. Why, why are you people are talking about that? No, no, no. So it's controlled. There are people who are listening to the programming. And if they are, they are irritated about the messages that they hear on the radio, it's easy to pick up a call and say, no, 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 just, just end that. Mm -hmm. So the role of a media that is not controlled by the state in the African continent, especially in countries where there are conflicts, that is critical. So as to ensure that the message that goes out to people is a credible message. And unless we unless we address that, and we, we will always just, you know, have have uh, the African population that is that is not really aware about what's going on in their countries because they don't get clear, um, uh, credible information from from different government institutions, but you also run a risk of those radio stations themselves. I mean, what we see, for instance, here in South Africa, with the community radio stations, they started very well. Community radio stations started very well with a clear defined role in terms of their contribution into societies. But you look at them now; some of them they've degenerated to being a playground of government spin doctors. You know what I mean? And they just, they use them as just as platforms to just pass information on and and to unsuspecting audiences out there without them being questioned and without being asked difficult questions. So what what how do you say that information then is credible? Because we can't just say radio is a great platform for information, you know what I mean, to pass all information to people without scrutinizing the credibility of the message that goes out. Mm. We, we can't do that. It can't just be that. No, it's a great platform for, for information and people listening and so on. We, we have to be critical. We have to scrutinize the, the message that people are being told because they, they could be, you know, I mean, they, they could be misled about a lot of things and they, they, they could be lied to. And so that's why it is important to have people on the media, in the radio, that will be able to say, no, this is not, this is not how it should be. This message is not correct. That information, somebody talked about fact checking, you know, information that comes through. You can't just be taking information and you pass it on and, and to people and then that, that information gets to mislead people and people get lied to and then it sparks uh, confusion and tensions and later on it could create some conflicts mm. yeah thank you uh for that um i we have questions coming in from a uh, youtube um i'd like that uh, each uh, panelist try keep it um at two uh, two minutes uh, for your answer because this one is for all of you and also guests are more than welcome um to uh, ask questions uh, to our fellow panelists 
Um, uh, please make sure you direct the questions either on uh, uh, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter at uh, Channel Africa One on each uh, platform. So we have a question coming in uh, from Mubanga Lumpa, who says, uh, would the panel share more insights on the role of radio freedom in the freedom struggle of South Africa and Namibia, which was hosted in Zambia during the liberation struggle. Um, we'd like uh, that, I know it's quite a mouthful, <laughs> but uh, we just hope that each panelist can at least try keep it at at least two minutes so that we have a chance for more questions as well. Thank you. I'd like to hand over, um, yeah, whoever would like to begin that one. Uh, maybe a bit of perspective on Sako. It's a very interesting uh, question. Uh, mm. You may appreciate for some of our guests that may not be aware that uh, ZNBC, for instance, hosted uh, Radio 3, uh, which channel was used to uh, basically um, allow uh, individuals that were outside of their countries within the Southern African region to be able to reach out to their uh, you know, communities and communicate uh, messages of uh, you know, uh, freedom struggle, if you like. And I think that is uh, the perspective you must have even as you respond. Thank you. Uh, sorry, colleagues, I just want to also get in there um, because we are a bit, uh, you know, tight on time. Uh, we, we, can, we don't have to all answer the question. Um, perhaps those who would like to answer the question may answer, um, of course, from the perspective. Um, but just to repeat it, would the panel share more insights on the role of radio freedom in the freedom struggle of South Africa and Namibia, which was hosted in Zambia during the liberation struggle? Uh, I'd like to hand over to the first uh, up, Mr. Tammy Dixon, you can respond. Okay, thank you very much, Nsabu. All right, radio freedom, it's, uh, it's quite a very, very interesting uh, development during the struggle for freedom in South Africa. It came up early in, in the 1960s, formed by the ANC, the African National Congress, which is the ruling party in South Africa today. As part of, uh, remember that the, the, the organizations that were fighting for freedom in South Africa were banned in, the, in 1960. So they were banned, in other words, they were not allowed to operate. They were not allowed to do political programs. Their leaders were not allowed to speak anywhere. There were no rallies, there were no gatherings. So they were closed down. And then after that, leaders were arrested. And many of them, they were sent to prison. Some of them eventually went to Robben Island. And a lot of other leaders from South Africa, they, they went into exile into many African countries and elsewhere in Europe. So there was then um, a total lull in the country in, in terms of what was happening about 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 the struggle against against the party. And so the the danger with that space was that the, the apartheid government would have won if people in South Africa believed that maybe the the political organizations that were fighting for freedom were actually killed. So the, the apartheid government would have won that struggle because that's that's what they wanted to do. They wanted the people in South Africa to believe that, no, this thing that you were doing, it's dead. And we have arrested your leaders. They, they are elsewhere, they ran away and so on. So the ANC in exile came up with the concept of uh, radio freedom. Of course, it was assisted by other countries uh, from, U uh, from, from Europe and elsewhere in the African continent to form up this radio station. That was going to be sort of a proof of life for the ANC back in South Africa and elsewhere, maybe in Namibia as well, to say, we are here. Don't believe what the South African government is telling you. We, we, we exist. We are here. And then people began to hear these messages. Oh, OK. So they, they, they had Oliver Tambo and many other leaders. Oh, OK. And, and talking on the radio and, and many African leaders actually talking on the radio. And, and that actually, right, I think it's a classic example of what radio can do. Uh, in terms of the messages and how it can mobilize people, because that's what Radio Freedom does. It really assisted the ANC to be able to reconnect with 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 the masses of the people after the organization was was banned. But it also gave them a chance to prove themselves that we are still alive, and let's continue fighting. And the the biggest mobilization actually that happened was because of 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 Radio Freedom. 
because they were connecting with people. People were, were began to go out into the streets. They began to, to fight more. They, they began to push more because now they've got proof now, which they got from the radio, that they are leaders. They're actually alive. This whole thing that we're doing is still is still is still alive. Let's let's keep on going. So it assisted a lot in terms of strengthening the mobilization of people against the apartheid system. And what the, Af- the South African government did actually, it responded to that by forming what today we now know as Channel Africa. And they, they established this radio station as a counter to what the ANC did uh, with, with, with Radio Freedom. And, and they established Channel Africa so as to push back and whatever the ANC was doing to glorify the apartheid system, to make it uh, as, a, as something that people should be should be happy about. So I thought I should start from there. Maybe uh, um, 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 our panelists can maybe add to that and, and maybe or subtract if there's something that is misleading, yeah? Adding to what Tammy highlighted, I think for me, um, I would like to say that what resonates the most for me about radio freedom um, is RX Radio because it's people that are in the periphery and they want people to know what they're doing. So children with disabilities. So as Tammy said, that is people that were fighting for freedom from afar and they wanted to send out messages about the progress that was happening at that time. So I think now the children that we trying to service here at the station are pretty much doing that because uh, as children with conditions and children with disabilities uh, living you know, with fears and concerns and 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 pretty much you know having people that don't understand what they're trying to fight for trying to exist and trying to just be humans you know amongst humans uh, because people have sent that distinction that they are different so i think for me um and and linking up with professor elion about negative peace and positive peace i think our programs then um provide that therapeutic piss for the reporters where they then uh, find ability in disability and and vocalize uh, the things that affect them. So I guess for me, uh, that history, and I think it's the question that you were asking me earlier on about children and and young people and and should we be hearing from them and I think I just want to tie it to that to say that for sure because Mm -hmm. then they're the people that are curating uh, taking from you know the previous generation and the challenges that they've combated and then they're bringing it with the current to lead us to the future so I think for me the 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 issue of child participation and having them being part of the daily occurrences uh, it pairs very well to the history of people that wanted to be seen, the people that were, were fighting for the freedom and using the means that they had to then set up a stepping stone for people to benefit from the pre- the freedom that now we are privy to and, and benefiting for. Thank you so much for that. I would like to cross over to the professor. Uh, after the professor shares his views, we'd like a 30 second closing statement and then we will close uh, the webinar officially. Uh, professor, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And again, building on what uh, Tammy has said, um, there's nothing to subtract, only to add a little. Uh, and I want to add, uh, is quoting what uh, the late uh, Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan, said in underscoring the importance of radio and what uh, Radio Freedom, and by the way, there were other radio stations also uh, which were supporting the liberation. Radio Freedom for the ANC, uh, Voice of Namibia for Swapo, and Voice of the Revolution for Zapo and the Zipra, then Voice of Zimbabwe for Zanu and Zanla. All these were being used to communicate. Now, what did Kofi Annan say? Kofi Annan said, radio gives voice and visibility. Mm-hmm. Now, these were people who, were, who didn't have a voice in their countries which they were trying to liberate. They couldn't get uh, uh, to communicate with their people to strengthen them to see that, okay, look, we are still going to win. Uh, they didn't have that. And radio bridged the gap. It broke the distance and went into the homes. And by the way, in South Africa, uh, during the apartheid period, even to listen to radio freedom would have been a crime. So you had to listen when the lights are off and uh, in your quiet uh, moment of uh, in your house so that uh, you are not uh, heard or you are not uh, even betrayed by the informers and things like that. But the important point is that radio penetrated uh, into 
the homes, including those who were supporting apartheid, they had. Uh, so radio uh, gives voice to the voiceless and also it brings visibility. So that, uh, because, you know, uh, people want to be seen that, uh, okay, have you seen me? Have you, if you can see me, perhaps you can hear me so that we can communicate. So it brings voice and visibility. Um, and I wanted to tie in, uh, you know, this is why the United Nations uh, in peacekeeping missions has recognized radio as part and parcel of peacekeeping. And there are so many radio stations that have been established in Africa to address issues that we have talked about, uh, building trust, uh, uh, mobilizing people and uh, um, reconciliation and things like that. All those uh, uh, radio is an important tool. Young people, uh, look, young people are very easy to maybe persuade or even to mislead as long as it's exciting. They, they have so much energy. Uh, and uh, if you go, uh, if you look at the history of, uh, or even contemporary, uh, Uganda, we have the Lord's Resistance Army, and which recruited young people, child soldiers. Uh, and it was radio, which started to pull out uh, people from, young people from uh, uh, the bush. There was a specific radio program, I think it was uh, uh, come out of the bush, something like that. Um, then, but I, I wanted to end on this note. Uh, because we have talked about so much the, uh, the importance of radio in building peace, um, again, the panelists here have indicated uh, the people that are holding the microphone, do they know about peace building? Uh, I would like to challenge or maybe encourage uh, that uh, let people who get on radio and know something about peace building because they are very important uh, players. Uh, the voice that they hold uh, it can can build or it can destroy. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to our panelists. I would like to start with Uvus Muzi um, uh, with your 30 second. <laughs> we are running slightly over time, but uh, a very, very uh, short uh, closing comment um, to really say happy uh, World Radio Day to us all. Um, from Uvus Muzi, we will, I'm not really sure the order on my screen, but uh, it's fine. I will direct you guys, <laughs> don't worry. Uvus Muzi, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Nsako. Yeah. Uh... Yes, I, I think uh, firstly just to thank uh, the SAP, uh, the SAPC, the NPC, the Mel and Guardian for organizing this uh, important uh, platform. Uh, I think, uh, like we mentioned earlier, that radio remains one of the most widely used uh, used mediums uh, across uh, Africa, and it is a medium through which we see ourselves as a people. It is the medium that uh, reflects uh, our peoplehood as a society. And I think as we commemorate uh, World Radio Day, we need to uh, remind ourselves, remind each other of the important role uh, that radio plays in promoting peace and also in identifying certain things that may threaten uh, the peace that we are enjoying. And most importantly, uh, just uh, lastly, uh, also to see radio as a tool for uh, regional integration like across uh, Southern Africa, I think radio Prof has just shared in terms of how different uh, liberation movements were using radio to communicate with each other and to communicate with their audiences back home. And I think we can build on some of these foundations uh, to promote peace across the region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vosmuzi. Uh, we want to cross over to uh, Musitsana Maribede. Your closing comment. I'd like to say also as um, media practitioners, uh, a lot is on us. As you were talking about radio freedom, it, it can go both ways. Uh, we always have to look at it, is it our place, really? Um, and where do we want to go with it? The minute you, we should look at the issues that we have at hand and, you know, make very deliberate decisions on them. But uh, the issue here is is peace. If you do it for the other party, uh, what is coming your way from the other party? Uh, so we should always weigh our options. Is it our place? And what is our responsibility as uh, media practitioners? 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sitsana Maribede. Uh, Marikana Majila, your 30 second closing comment. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, for, um, for this insightful um, seminar. I think it's just two things. I think two things that we need to constantly work on over and above what has already been said is two things. It's radio management, the people that are in the forefront of managing radio, and two, the regulatory space. Um, these are the two things that can cripple radio. And if we're not uh, going to work tirelessly on to make sure that they keep improving, they keep on the taps, um, then the future of radio uh, will, will definitely um, be in the dark. Thank you very much and thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Marikana Majila. We're going to go up to Yoli Ngomani from RX Radio SA. Sure, thank you so much. I'm grateful for this opportunity. I think for me, I could say that um, it's very much important that uh, we know and understand that radio will always be relevant, uh, but it's a matter of how people are using it. And I think it's, it's morphed now into a multimedia, you know, type of um, a program. And I think um, it being that movement is very important now uh, to make sure that young people are in the forefront and are in the center um, of it because uh, it, it, it provides a space for people to talk about things that are concerning to them and for you know the audiences to be educated going forward so and i think it's got a, a huge potential in breaking down a lot of stereotypical views concerning to our daily challenges and it brings peace as well uh to the country that we live in that has got a lot of challenges and misconceptions around how we are as human beings and i think um for RX Radio, uh, for people that don't know RX Radio, go to our website, www.rxradio.co.za, and it's really a movement that's set to advocate for children's movement and children's rights and for children to have a voice, you know, in the future and continue to be well-rounded citizens. Thank you, Yoli. Tommy Dixon. Thank you very much. Uh, um, this, this has been quite a very insightful very great uh, platform and discussions the views that they've come across quite very very interesting but what i would like to uh, the point that i would like to make just as an appeal that um to all of us who operate radio within the african continent i think we need to come closer to each other and in terms of partnerships and create space where we can share information because we, we're talking to Afri African audiences. I think the, the big picture here, which we should not lose, and I know that we are individual radio stations, we are running maybe after our own revenues and, and all of that, but I think the big picture that we should not, lo we should not uh, lose here is that we are all talking to African audiences. So we need to find space uh, where we can collaborate, have partnerships, share information. I mean, Channel Africa is, is one of the unique radio stations of the SABC. I mean, that, uh, that, that none of the radio stations that, are, that belong to SABC do what the Channel Africa does, because we talk to every corner of the African continent uh, in five languages. I mean, five, I mean, one radio station cannot do that. But Channel Africa does that. I mean, we, we use five languages in one radio stations. We, we are in the Francophone Africa, we are in the Anglophone, we are in the Lusophone Africa, Kiswahili, we are dominating there, and, and the Nyanza language as well, we are also dominating there. So I'm saying we, we need to find space where we can collaborate to ensure that uh, our content that goes out to our African audiences is, is a shared content. All right? Thanks, man. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, professor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for having me on this very important uh, program and uh, wish uh, the broadcasters a very happy uh, radio day today. Uh, my concluding remarks are that uh, let's keep speaking with one another. Uh, it is only by speaking that we exchange ideas and uh, we get to hear what uh, is in somebody's mind and we could prevent a lot of uh, conflicts. Africa is uh, going towards uh, uh, integration. Uh, that's the Africa we want, Agenda 2063. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. uh, of the Africa Union. So it's important that uh, in our conversations as we speak on radio, uh, we don't only promote peace, uh, we also see that one of the avenues of at arriving at a peaceful continent is this uh, integration. Uh, so may, 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 may radio live forever. When I was much younger at primary school, I learned the skill of uh, making radio. So that was the first thing that I ever made, a radio. And uh, I started listening to radio. I've fallen in love with it and uh, I listened to it and made radio live long. I won't say forever because uh, forever is... <laughs> Uh, but um, let radio survive for a very long to come. You have a very big role to play in um, uh, fostering a, 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 a continent that we all have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my co-driver, the car that has two steering wheels. <laughs> <laughs> it's been such an engaging, uh, you know, uh, moment to discuss with all of you. I would like to thank you ever so much. And uh, we also would like to thank our audiences uh, across the various platforms, YouTube, Facebook, and our partner radio stations and television stations. Uh, this has been a webinar, of course, uh, discussing what radio can, can do for all of us, of course, to advance causes of peace. Now, remember that we are all each other's brothers and sisters keepers. Let us use the microphone responsibly so that we can build ourselves. We'd like to thank you very much. And then, Sako, you've been brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just before we officially close off, uh, there's a comment from Mirta uh, Lorenzo. She says, radio is a vector of peace if it enjoys freedom from commercial, ideological, or political influence. Increasing support to independent radio is a way of investing in peace. With that being said, ladies and gentlemen, to the guest, Thank you so much and a happy World Radio Day. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>